Welcome to the CPA Advisory Show. I am your host, Jeremy Wells, CPA, and with me is my co-host, Chris Hervishan, CPA. Hey, Chris, how you doing? Doing great. How about yourself? I am doing well. Chris, jump right into this episode. You mentioned something in a prior episode uh, when we were talking about month end close and how you're tracking the workflow in your firm. You mentioned a particular piece of software that at first didn't seem quite right based on what we were talking about. <laughs> uh, and so I've been thinking about it ever since we recorded that episode and I need to hear this story. So you mentioned a specific piece of software that you're using to track that workflow. What is that software? And it's not software that I usually hear brought up among accountants and how they run their firm. So tell us about that. Yeah, uh, sure thing. So we use Zendesk, which uh, I guess historically is a help desk type system. So a ticketing system, basically. And that, that's how we run our firm. Now, the long story, the long version of that story, since we have all this time on this podcast, is that I did some contract work for another CPA firm years ago, um, seven, eight years ago is when I started with that. And they use Zendesk and they were a very progressive firm, a lot of custom code, um, you know, a lot of custom processes, highly automated. And I just kind of got used to working in Zendesk. And so when I went out full time on my own, because I started this, this firm as a side hustle. So when I went out full time on my own, the first thing I got was Zendesk to just kind of manage my work. Now I have evolved the use of that in our firm over time and we have what we call the tasker and what the tasker is essentially is it's a really big Google sheet and on this Google sheet are all of the things that repeat that we do for our clients. So engagement letter comes in, the engagement letter gets signed, the engagement letter lists out all of the things that we offer in our monthly subscription service. I put those items into the tasker and then we use make or integer map. Um, to loop over that list every single day and figure out what is uh, the task that needs to get generated today, if any, when it's due, uh, the descriptions on those tasks and things like that. And so we have this constant you know, cycle that's fairly automated at, at that um, that's generating these tickets. And then we just work through them as we go through the month end close or as we go through like yearly closes, tax type stuff, things like that. I like it a lot because it lets me see number one, how much work is assigned to anybody at any given time. Uh, and we go by ticket counts. Like, yes, there are, are different um, complexities to different tickets and things like that. And yes, we have a subset of what we call ad hoc stuff. So things that clients have sent to us that we weren't necessarily expecting or that aren't necessarily recurring. But I can see the workload that everybody has at any given time. Uh, inside of the tasker, we have just estimated times on how long something should take. So you know, like a financial review should take about an hour. And so I can forecast out some capacity um, or utilization um, from that, from those metrics. And then I can see turnaround times. I can see response times. And then that's how, basically how we manage the firm. Number one, we want to make sure that on average, we're closing out these things in five days or less. And we want to make sure that we're uh, responding to clients in 48 hours or less and, we, and less and we manage those. And then we can also manage due dates and things like that. So that's the way that we do it. I understand that that's maybe not the way that probably any other firm does it, uh, probably for good reason. But um, Jeremy, we had a conversation a couple of weeks ago and you, you you asked me a question like, why are you using a ticketing system versus a practice management system? I said, I don't even know what a practice management system is. So tell me about a practice management system and what that really should look like or does look like and then how you use it. Yeah, so this was uh, something that I had to figure out really for my for my own firm uh, a few years ago. Let's see, I'm going on almost three years now uh, since I had to had to pick one uh, for my firm. And at that time, I had uh, contracted with a firm that used Asana, which is which is just a general sort of project management uh, software. It's it's really built for you know the general public. It's uh, you know teams, businesses, individuals, even. So yeah, I wouldn't call it practice management software. I would call it more just project management software. Uh, but uh, there's that. And then I... So what's I, the difference between practice management and project management? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. Um, so to me, the in, in a project manager, the, the sort of um, 
unit of analysis there is is the project or the task right for assigned to each project and and you're thinking about moving a project from creation to you've got this list of tasks you check the tasks off and then the project is done and so you're going to sort of you know either process that project as, as done or archived or something like that so you're, you're um you know another popular way of uh doing this is a uh, is through software uh is um something uh like todoist or even uh and i'm i'm blanking on the name of it now the the one that's the uh, cards uh that you slide across monday is that monday uh monday is one that is like at trello like, uh, oh, trello trello is trello. Yeah. the other one right trello is built yep. on uh the kanban system right so that mm -hmm. in this case every project would be a card and that card would move across and i i've worked with uh some groups and some companies that love trello right they use trello uh this because you set up these cards and you have different columns and each column is a step uh, toward completion, right? And so as that card moves from left to right, it's it's becoming more complete until you get to the end and then the card is just done. As opposed to practice management, right? Where the unit of analysis to me is, the project is still important, but really the most important thing is the, is the client um, and, and really the, the relationship with that client. So when I log into my practice manager, which is Carbon, um, I'm not looking at carbon only for the the project that needs to get done that I need to work on. That's an important part of it. That's it's probably the most important part of it. But then I'm looking at what client that project is related to. And so then I go to the client view and I see what all the open work for that client is and who's working on the work for that client, what staff are assigned um, in different roles on that client's team. What's the communication history with that team? This is one thing that I love about Carbon is that uh, on any client uh, view within Carbon, you have tabs. One of those tabs is uh, the, the timeline. And so you see all of the uh, projects, all of the emails, all of the notes that you've made. And so you have this timeline from the very beginning of the relationship with that client that you can scroll through and search. Um, so, you know, if there was a call a year ago and I remember something from that call that I want to look up, then I can scroll down, find that call and read back through the notes from that call. Or if there's an email, right, I can find that email along with all of the work completed, in process, planned. Um, and so and then the team for that client. So it's more of a comprehensive uh, approach, one. And then two, it focuses, to me, it focuses more on the relationship with the client rather than just the individual project level. Yeah, I'm with you there. Um, one of the things that I really like using Zendesk and one of the reasons why it's become so much more valuable to us over time is that history. Like we can go and figure out what we said to any client at all, at all over the last four years and how that went, what the, what the discussion was, um, internal notes, external notes. So notes that we sent to like, actually sent publicly to the client, things like that. And we can see all of that history and that's super valuable inside of a firm, right? Cause I can theoretically pass off clients or engagements to other team members. They can go in and look at the history and get a sense of this is how this has gone. This is how this has operated. Well, like things like tax returns, I can say, okay, well, you know, this was an issue last year and this is how it was resolved and see the whole history of that and see how it um, evolved. And I find that to be hugely important. It sounds like practice management software will allow you to do much the same thing. Yeah, I think so. And, and, you know, I think, um, you know, you can say, well, if, it, if it's in email, you know, I can just search through my Gmail or through my Outlook or something. It's like, yes, you can, right? You could search by contact, you could search by key term. Um, but I, I think the power of organizing that and breaking it down into uh, not just the the contact, but also the client, right? Because sometimes there's a difference between the client and the contact. You might have one sure. client that's a business that you've got multiple contacts for, or you might have one contact, right, who owns three or four businesses and you're doing books and taxes for all those different businesses. And so, you know, if you're searching by contact in your email, you're going to spend a lot of time scrolling through a lot of irrelevant messages that might show up in your search. Um, whereas in a practice manager, you could break those down by contact, client, and even project all at the same time and really get fine grain before you have to start scrolling and searching around for that missing message or, or project or, or whatever it is. 
What about across team members too? Yeah, and that's another good one. Um, so I think that's another uh, aspect of a pra- practice uh, manager versus uh, maybe one of these more general project managers like uh, Trello or Asana or something like that, where uh, built into the practice manager are the typical sort of capacity management and capacity tracking and workload tracking uh, features. So for example, in Carbon, um, it has time tracking built in. I don't use time tracking. That's a topic for a future episode, um, but it has that built into it. You can create budgets in terms of both time and uh, dollars for uh, for different projects. And so you can see, for example, uh, the, the dollar value of the outstanding work uh, that you have there in Carbon. And then of course, uh, who all is assigned to what. That's another thing, um, you know, it, comparing a practice manager that has an integration with email like Carbon does uh, versus just searching through your own Gmail is you're only going to see the messages you've sent and received. And so what this will do, lead a lot of uh, firm owners, business owners, team leaders to do is just have everybody copy everybody on everything. Um, and so now we just all see all the email threads from everything and it's an email becomes horrible. Whereas with Carbon, a staff member can send an email to a client without copying me, without me even knowing about that email, but because it's tied to that client, I can always go to that client's record in Carbon and I can see all of those emails and all of those messages and all of those notes. So it makes it really easy to just keep up with what's going on with the relationship with the client and at the same time, make it to where I'm not the only one having to be on top of all that. Okay. So is this something where you can, well, let me ask this question first. Is the email going through Carbon or is the email going through your Gmail that is connected to Carbon? Yeah. So as far as email goes, uh, Carbon integrates with uh, Gmail and Outlook, maybe a couple others, um, but those are the two big ones, I think. And so it's essentially a UI that sits on top of uh, the email. And so, for example, when I, uh, Carbon uses the word clear, uh, but when I clear an email out of my triage or inbox in Carbon, it archives the email in Gmail and vice versa. If I went straight into Gmail and archived an email in Gmail, it would disappear. It would show up as cleared um, in Carbon. So there is a two-way sync there. And what I do in one uh, can affect the other one. But when I archive that message in uh, in, in Gmail, that email still exists inside of Carbon. It still exists in that client record. And so, you know, there, it, it'll always still be there as part of uh, that client record. And, and that makes it, uh, so, it makes it fairly dependable as, as sort of a, a source of truth of what's going on in that relationship and what the history of that relationship has been. So what do you do with emails that are, because what I'm hearing you say is that they, there's a two-way sync that's just mm-hmm. happening to some extent or one and a half way sync is almost what it sounds like. Yeah. So what do you do with emails? that's like, they're spam that aren't, that have nothing to do with a client. Like are those showing up in the practice management system? And then, then what are we doing? Yeah. Uh, and so the, the, again, the way, the way carbon, uh, talks about this and they use slightly different language than, than what we're used to. If you're using, uh, your, your email, uh, program, whether it's Gmail or or Outlook, um, as where you do email, right? So this is one of the things that you learn very quickly when you start using something like Carbon is that you stop doing email in Gmail or Outlook, you start doing it solely in Carbon. And so yes, everything that's going to show up in your inbox in Gmail or Outlook shows up in your, what Carbon calls your triage. And your triage is, is sort of your inbox for your email, along with internal notifications. So you can comment uh, on things with your with your staff. Uh, you can share work. You can get notifications that work has been completed or assigned to you. Things like that also show up in your triage. But for the most part, we're talking about email. So then you've got everything from your inbox there. Carbon is pretty good about uh, giving you some filters. Uh, So for example, I can filter to where I'm only seeing the notifications, the internal sort of notifications. That'll actually block all the email out, which is great if I'm trying to process through work and I don't want to worry about email right now, right? On the flip side, uh, on the email side, it has two filters. One is for uh, from contacts and the other one is from not contacts. Right. So if you think about your Gmail or Outlook inbox, you're just seeing a list of everything. It's all of the the spam, the the cold email outreach along with clients. It's all mixed together. In Carbon, if an email is from a contact that you've added in Carbon, then when you click on that, only messages from 
you know, contacts, then it'll only show you those and it'll sort of, uh, you know, uh, uh, filter out all of the rest. So it makes it really easy to say, you know, I'm in my morning uh, routine here where I'm trying to process my email, uh, you know, as quickly as possible before I start the work day. I only want to look at something that might be important. So I only want to see emails that clients might have sent me overnight. Okay. And so I'm only looking at emails from contacts. Uh, and so as long as your carbon contacts are only, you know, important, important people, right? So, so like your clients, uh, your vendors, things like that, then you'll only mm -hmm. see those messages. And then maybe later in the day, uh, you can go through those emails that aren't from contacts and get rid of a lot of those cold emails or, or spam or whatever else, newsletters. There's also another feature called low priority. Uh, and this one you got to be careful with in Carbon, but if you mark an email as low priority, uh, it's essentially like uh, creating a, a tag or a category um, in, in Gmail or Outlook uh, or, or another mailbox. Uh, it will then send every email from that email address into your low priority box. And it's just another tab that you've got to go to, but it will filter those out of your triage immediately, um, automatically without you having to do anything. I really don't use that uh, that much because I just keep the, the email that's coming to me fairly uh, slimmed down, at least to that uh, main work email address. And then I use those filters um, you know, from contacts and from non-contacts uh, pretty, pretty deliberately. Okay, got it. So last episode, we talked about the month end close. How does the month end close tie into the practice management system? Like, are we yeah. also managing tasks yeah. inside of there? How are those getting created? Or like, I know that you said um, you're using the books review feature yeah. inside of QBO. Like, is this, like, is that something that just sits totally outside of the practice manager? Like how do these things like talk to each other and work with each other? Yeah. So uh, quick review, the, the books review, the month end review in QuickBooks has four different uh, main steps to it. And each step has some sub steps within it. But for those four main steps, the first three are done by the, the bookkeeper or the staff accountant. The final step is done by whatever you want to call that uh, position, either reviewer or virtual CFO or me as the partner, right? I'm, I'm, that, I'm that last uh, person. Um, but the, uh, the first uh, three steps I list out in the recurring work uh, in Carbon. Um, and so, uh, you know, just like a lot of uh, project managers or practice managers, uh, you can create work, you can define those steps, those tasks, uh, and then you can organize the different tasks into sections. You can assign those tasks to different people within the firm. You can set different deadlines on the work or on those different tasks. And then of course you can set all of that up to repeat uh, periodically. And so that's what I do in uh, Carbon. I set, I, we have a monthly close uh, work for each client that we're doing bookkeeping for. It's set to repeat every month. And those first three parts of the QBO month in close are three tasks that are organized into the first section and assigned to the accountant uh, in Carbon. When those three tasks are done, Carbon has what it calls automators, and you can set automators for each section. So if you think about your task list and your month end close, you might have, set, let, let's say it's you're doing your month end close entirely out of Carbon. Let's say you've got 20 different tasks, but it's not just a list of 20 different tasks, right? The first four tasks go together, the next six tasks go together. And so you're going to organize these into sections, and each section might be done by a different role or there might be a different sort of deadline. There might be a different dependency. Something you do in the second section can't be done until all the first section is done, for example. And so those automators are what help you build the logic into the workflow. So for example, you would set an automator in the second section that says, once all the tasks in the first section are done, then set a due date for three days from then for the next section. Right. So whereas if you hard coded those due dates in, you might have tasks in the first section that aren't done, but now you're behind on all the rest of it um, yeah. as far as the, the hard coded deadlines are. And I don't really want that. I don't want work to pile up. I want work to push out based on when we're actually flowing through uh, the work, as, as long as it's not strictly deadline sensitive. Um, and so those automators really help build in a logic that makes work flow. And while at the same time, uh, you know, not letting work pile up on us. So what, what about analytics? Like what, what kind of analytics are you getting and what's important to you and 
how you're managing your firm? Yeah, that's a good that's a good question. Um, so there's a couple different ways you could do that. One is uh, inside of Carbon, there is the Work tab where you can see all of the open work, and the the filters there are pretty good. Uh, you can filter uh, on I think about maybe maybe about 15, 16 different. Uh, criteria. Uh, one, of course, is a signee, so I can filter and just see how much open work uh, there is for any given staff member. Right. Um, another one would be uh, the whether the work is overdue uh, or not. So I could, for example, you know, if you were in my staff, I could, you know, say, okay, I want to look at, you know, what's the overdue work on Chris's plate. And if I go in there and I see it's one or two things, and I'm like, oh yeah, I know why those are overdue. That's fine. That's, that's one thing. If I go in there and I see 10 things and I don't know why these things are overdue, they should have been done already, right? That's when I know I need to intervene. We need to have a conversation, right? Those kinds of things. And so that's a really good sort of top level uh, look at, uh, you know, where we're at in terms of individuals getting their work done. We can also uh, organize that and filter that by the type of work. So uh, I, you can think of these maybe as sort of like tags or categories uh, for different types of projects. So I have one that is individual tax for individual tax returns. I have one that's business tax. I have one that's accounting, one that's payroll, right? Um, so I might organize my list only by looking at accounting work that's overdue. And these would be monthly closes that, you know, it's already the next month after, you know, the month we should have finished up that month in close. And I can go back and say, okay, why are we not finishing these up? Why are these five clients not done inside of the following month for the month in review? Maybe it's because they're unresponsive and uncat, you know, maybe it's because uh, we've got some broken bank feeds or, you know, some of these typical things that make it to where work falls through the cracks. But if we had a better grasp on what is, you know, getting delayed, what's becoming overdue and why, then we can prevent it from completely falling through the cracks and, and getting lost forever. There are some analytics as far as things like email. So uh, without being able to see everybody's inbox, you know, how many, uh, how responsive people are in email. I don't think it's the same level of granularity uh, that you have in your ticketing uh, system, though. And this is something that, you know, it, Carbon is is relatively young and um, they're, they're actually pretty responsive uh, to users. They want, it, it was founded by accountants and it's built for accountants. And so they really want it to be uh, a useful tool for accounting firms. And there are some relatively large uh, firms, um, you know, probably more on the regional uh, side, large regional firms uh, that are using carbon. Um, but, uh, you know, they really want to be a product that works for uh, accounting firms, small and large. And so they're really responsive. In fact, they've got a fairly robust uh, community, online community, uh, the carbon community of, of users and uh, some of the, the actual uh, employees engage in there as well. And you'll see when you go in there and you, you recommend uh, something or you give some feedback, uh, you'll see within a day or two, one of their employees come in and mark something as, uh, you know, this is a good idea. This is something we should look into. And so, uh, you know, they're being responsive uh, as far as those things. And they're constantly updating every couple months. They're coming out with updates to uh, the functionality and the the abilities, capabilities within it. Yeah, I was just doing some searching here <laughs> while you were talking. And um, it does integrate with Zapier. It does. So that's it does. Step step one. A little bit, a little bit. Not, <laughs> yeah, not as I'm much as I would. That. Like. Not as much as I would like. So uh, for me, the the most important integration uh, is between Ignition and uh, Carbon. So so the two pieces of software that I tell anyone and everyone who will listen, uh, the two pieces of software that are the bedrock of my firm. That you know, if you could take everything away from my firm including QBO. I would switch over to zero from QBO before. Those are fighting words right there. I know. Believe me. Believe me. I know. Um, and that it hurts a little to say that, right? But yeah. um, but but Ignition and Carbon are the, the, the two tools that are the bedrock in my firm. So when I went completely independent in late 2019 um, and it was time to, uh, you know, really set things up, take over my billing, be able to file tax returns on my own, be able to keep track of uh, what was on my plate what client work 
uh, I had outstanding and I didn't have the benefit of, you know, my mentor's firm and his VA running all that for me. I knew I needed a way to get paid. So I went out and I got, at that time it was practice ignition. Now it's just ignition. I needed a way to track the work. I went and got Carmen and then I went and got my EFIN in the, in, so I could file the tax returns in that order. Um, and so since late 2019, I've been running on uh, those two pieces of the software. And, and, you know, and, and so, you know, back to the original point about being able to see that entire client history, I've got clients that I brought in, you know, when I went independent. And so, you know, all the way from, you know, late 2019, I've got every email, every note, every task, you know, that has been done uh, for that client. And, 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 you know, it would be, it would, it would take a seismic event uh, for me to give up that, that history and that, that catalog of data. Where in that ecosystem does a CRM sit? And then how yeah. does that fit in? Because it, my understanding of Ignition is that it's in more of an invoicing system than a CRM. Yeah. And Carbon is more of a project management tool than a CRM. So it, is maybe there's just no place for a CRM in that in that workflow. So you, you tell me. Yeah. And, and this is something, this is actually something that I've struggled with. And, and um, I've been in conversations with, with, uh, uh, developers and leaders in in both of these companies, both on ignition side and on uh, carbon side, about this. So you're right. So if you think about the the uh, tech stack and the flow within my firm, right? You know, a, a prospect comes to me, I send them the proposal from Ignition, they sign it. Ignition handles the billing and the and the payment collection uh, and and the actual uh, agreement, right? So so Ignition does all that. Then the integration between Ignition and Carbon uh, does this. Ignition will look at the different services that I've included in the proposal and and the agreement. And it links each of those services. I manually go in uh, to Ignition and it reads all of the work templates that exist in Carbon. And so it's got the service in Ignition and it's got the titles of the work templates in Carbon. And I link those two over in Ignition so that if you came to me as a prospect, you signed the proposal, now we've got an agreement. As soon as you do that, Ignition will create an instance of all of the different work templates based on the services that were included in that proposal you just signed. And now they exist under that client in Carbon. Is that recurring stuff? So like a subscription type offering? So the recurring stuff, now th this is one thing that needs to be worked on with the integration. It will create the first instance and then I need to go in to Carbon and define the terms of, of the repeating work. I also need to go in and reset deadlines because it sets the deadlines based on the actual uh, engagement, not on the actual work, right? So it'll be a monthly, it'll create the monthly bookkeeping uh, work or the monthly, you know, the month and close work, but it'll set the due dates as the same as the engagement, which might be 12 yeah. or 18 months or something. So I gotta go in, reset the deadlines and then create the repeating work, right? But it's there, right? And so now I can go into Carbon, I can find the new client that, that Ignition has created. I can see the list of work that we've agreed to do for that client. And then I can just modify those, that work, you know, 10, 15 minutes, depending on the complexity of the client. And now all of that work is created and set up to repeat and we're ready to start serving that client. So you're right, Very back cool. to your original question, you know, where's the CRM? I've got the history of, <laughs> you know, the, the communication with the client and the work done for the client sitting in carbon. I've got the client's, you know, payment information and in their agreement in ignition. You know, where's the actual, uh, you know, relationship manager. Uh, th there isn't one. So this is something that is on my wish list for both Ignition and Carbon, right? I would love to be able to go into Ignition, for example, because it knows all of my clients. It has all of my clients' email addresses and it has all the services we've agreed to do for those clients. I would love to be able to click a button that filters all of my clients by the ones that we have business tax returns for, right? So that I could shoot an email just to those clients, right? Or filter just for the ones that we're doing payroll for and be able to send an email to those clients. Same thing in Carbon, right? If, you know, I've got clients that have overdue individual tax return work outstanding, <laughs> it'd be nice if I could just spin up an email, right? That says, 
just letting all of you know, blanket email. So I'm not, you know, having to blind carbon copy everybody and manually rig this email up. And then I forget people and somebody replies all and, you know, all this nonsense, right? Uh -huh. um, you know, uh, so that, or that I have to create an email list and an email marketing system, you know, like MailChimp or ConvertKit or something. And now I've got this mix of people who are clients and people who've just signed up for my email list. And then I've got clients who don't want the marketing email. So they unsubscribe but now i can't send them client reminder emails anymore you know that's all kind of a mess um so you're right the crm part is what's missing from my tech stack i'm aware of that i've been aware of that it's something that um you know probably needs to work on for right now uh i keep the client roster small enough to where um it's easy enough to get around it in a few different ways but yeah that's that's probably the biggest missing component as far as really managing the client relationship yeah. So what are you doing for that? I'm, I famously have a, a super deep tech stack. Probably, I don't know if it's for good or for bad, but whatever. <laughs> it is what it is. So we've got the Zendesk. We talked about that. Uh, the Zendesk, who says that? Like I'm geriatric or something. Um, we've got Zendesk. Zendesk links up to HubSpot, which is our CRM. So everything that happens in Zendesk gets logged in in the CRM, which is cool because if you kind of think about the entire customer relationship, like I can see... This particular person came to our website. They visited this page, this page, this page, and this page. Hopefully, they viewed the pricing page. They downloaded a form, or they uh, they completed a form, downloaded some sort of a free uh, lead magnet, something like that, and then they booked a call. And then you can start to see, you know, sign the engagement letter, and um, you know the whole track of work that happens, which is gonna, that's pretty much where Zendesk picks it up, right? So there's that piece. That's cool. But then we also use Mailchimp. And MailChimp is our email uh, service that we use. So if we're going to send out any any sort of mass email, if we're going to send out you know a newsletter, things like that, that's MailChimp. And MailChimp integrates with HubSpot. HubSpot integrates with Zendesk. And so all these things kind of talk to each other. Uh, for the most part, yeah. So they all integrate with Make, which is really what I'm looking for. That's the glue that holds my firm together. If we want to automate anything, if we want to move data from one place to the other, we're going to be using Make. We use Zapier a little bit, not not so much. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what we're doing. Like candidly, we, I've been using HubSpot for four years and I don't think until fairly recently, we've really leveraged that in order to drive new revenue. I think from a CRM perspective, the most important function of that is on the front end on the new revenue side, as opposed to managing that throughout the course of the engagement. Cause I think kind of to your point, really once you get into it, once, once they're already a client, once you're doing the work, it's really more about the workflows and, you know, project management type stuff. And, you know, that's really a function that I feel Zendesk helps with the most as opposed to the CRM. Yeah, I would agree with that. So what, um, so if you're, it, it, I have uh, sort of done some cursory research over the years on HubSpot, but I've never actually, you know, dive into it myself. So what, are you actually using HubSpot for? And what are some of the things that it could do, but you've decided to use something different instead? Because you said you use MailChimp, but I was under the impression that you could do some email marketing and stuff like that from HubSpot. Are you using it for billing? You know, what what are you using it for and would you decide to use something different instead? Yeah, that's a good question. And the HubSpot features have been built out quite a bit since we first started using it. The thing about HubSpot is that it's wildly expensive. And so we're using like a $50 a month type of subscription, which gets us limited resources. If we were to, to go, I think it's 800 bucks a month, something like that, and get the full boat, um, marketing hub, sales hub. And then I think there's another uh, module to that. We would be spending a whole bunch of money that I don't think we'd really get an ROI on. So really what we're using it for, number one, it's our booking widget. So we don't use Calendly or anything like that. We're using the HubSpot links that we generate. And that's how we send out meeting links and things like that. So that's, that's a big piece of what we do. Um, just managing contacts, people who have come into our orbit, either they visited a web page or we've done some um, cold outreach, things like that. I've got a salesperson who is basically living inside of HubSpot all day, every day. Um, we use it for some forms. We use it for maybe a landing page or two. I'm not entirely sure about that. Uh, but it's really just a great source of data where you can go in and you can see like, all right, this person booked a discovery call with me. 
and I can see that they've looked at the pricing page, they've downloaded every last resource that we have, they've been visiting our website for three months. Like that gives me an idea going into the conversation of what it's going to look like. And I've noticed that there's a big difference between that and when I go into a into a conversation, they booked a discovery call with me. They haven't looked at hardly anything on their website. They haven't looked at the pricing page. Like that conversation is going to go a lot different than than the other. So that's a lot of what we're what we're using it for. It's a little bit more, you know, last time I looked at it anyway, it's a little bit more price effective to use HubSpot in that limited way, plus MailChimp and and go from there. Um yeah, that's, I mean, that's, that's pretty much it. Yeah. So wh what I, what I'm taking away from this is, you know, we started this conversation talking about practice managers um, and, and yeah. really even more specifically than that, the project management within uh, the firm and how, you know, one of the main functions of the practice manager is to do that. But then, uh, you know, then you start thinking and transitioning into, okay, because, uh, you know, what we primarily do for our clients is this work and, and keeping up with this work and the reminders, that's really the main component, but not the sole component of the client relationship as a whole. And so we need to make sure that we're tracking and managing the client relationship. And then that turns into an even broader uh, concept of before somebody even becomes a client, right? You know, where, where, how are they getting to us? Are they, are they an inbound lead? Are they an outbound lead? You know, do, are they a referral? How did they come by us? If they came to our website, what part of the website got them, you know, to us? How did they book that initial call with us or get that initial sort of, and, and so, you know, I think it's really interesting that this conversation ties all these different aspects together because it's so easy when you're running an accounting firm, especially a, a, you know, solo firm or, you know, a solo owned firm, it's so easy to get into the weeds of, you know, just getting the work done. Right. And so you think about practice management as just, we have all this work to do and we've got to make sure all the work is getting done. But at the same time, you've got the relationships to build and foster, and then you've got the actual sales and marketing component of your firm to bring into that as well. And think about how all of this ties together. Um, and, and so I think there are tools like this that, you know, either you could use one of these sort of one-stop shops like HubSpot or Salesforce or something like that, that would tie all of these data together under you know, one program. Um, or you do more of the, the, the piecemeal sort of approach of where you've got you know, a dozen different apps in your tech stack that are all tied together through integrations or APIs or whatever. But um, yeah, it's just... It's it's a super interesting story, and I, I, I'm just I'm wondering about the firm owners out there who just aren't thinking about all of these different aspects, you know, of the of the client relationship. That you know, yeah, they're just they're buried in their practice manager, they're buried in their workflow, and that's really kind of as far as they go, um, you know. But I think there are some options out there that they could really expand their understanding of all of these different things that are going on in their operations and their firms. It's a, it's a great point. I think it's really easy as a solopreneur who just started your firm to sit there and be worried about getting the work done and you don't want to spend money on a whole bunch of tech because maybe you're going to get a benefit from it. Maybe you're not. And you're worried about putting food on the table and trying to get your first client, like that sort of thing. Like been there, done that, totally understand that mindset. But I'll go back to something I said at the very beginning of the, of the episode that Zendesk instance for us is worth so much more. It is an enormous investment than it was four years ago. And we just had like one client, two clients or whatever. And, you know, wasn't much activity in there. Like now, I mean, we went from, I don't know, maybe like 10 tickets a month, something like that. We're generating over a thousand now, I think is, is what our number is. And that just creates this enormous database of information. And that is worth something it's worth something in a variety of ways. Number one, when I bring on new team members, when I bring on new staff, they can go back and they can look at the history of this client and get a real understanding of these are all of the things that have happened. Uh, and then number two, like if somebody comes in to buy my firm, here's all the history. I don't have it sitting in paper files that are sitting in some cabinet or in some storage unit somewhere. It's all digital. It's all electronic. To some extent, I can export all of that out and put into some other format, but it, it's all there. So that's the task management piece. But then I've also, you know, Zendesk has this capability of um, Zendesk guide and it's a knowledge base. 
And so we've got articles in there, several hundred articles that we've written over the course of time. Some of them are industry specific, some of them are client specific, some of them are internal firm operation specific, but that database keeps getting built over time and that makes the firm worth something, right? So we're building value and we're also standardizing processes, uh, developing knowledge and expertise in certain areas and things like that. It's, you know, it, it, it's just one of those things. It's an investment and it grows in value over time. Yeah, absolutely. And I, th- I think that last part there is, is key. You know, you're building these processes and you're managing these relationships and you're answering questions. And over time you accumulate this, this unique knowledge, right? Not just of your clients and their industries, but you know, just your general firm operations. And if all of that lives inside your head, uh, then it's not worth anything to anyone else. But if you can document that, if you can get that out into a system that you can relatively easily plug other staff or partners or potential firm owners uh, into, then it really drives up the value of, of the firm that you're building. That's a that's, a, that's definitely a long-term uh, way of thinking about it there. I'm curious, over the last five minutes, I've been thinking about this. On a scale of one to 10, how concerned are you with integrated data? Meaning that data that talks to each other across the firm. Like, you know, another way of asking that would be if you're going to go take a look at a new app or a new process or something like that, how interested are you in how well it integrates with what you already have? Or is it one of these things where, you know, I just want this particular thing that does this particular thing. And, you know, if it integrates great, if if not, then whatever. I am, uh, I'm I'm probably going to say it's about a seven or eight. I mean, it, it, it's high. It's not necessarily a deal breaker depending on what it is. Um, but man, I hate, I hate duplicating uh, information. So, you know, if there's a way that somebody can click a button in one place and then the four or five apps that need to do something <laughs> with that information, just have it and, and do it. Uh, so for example, with, uh, with Ignition, when uh, I create a proposal, uh, and, and send that proposal out and the prospect actually signs that uh, proposal and agrees to it. And now they're a client. Uh, that information is exported uh, to Carbon. And so Carbon creates the, the client based on the information in Ignition. And then also that information goes to QuickBooks Online. That's another integration between Ignition and QBO. And so uh, Ignition actually sends in the invoices out using QBO's uh, invoice. And I think if you're a zero user, it'll do the same thing with zero. Um, but but QB, uh, Ignition actually handles the billing and the, and the payment processing, but it uses QBO's invoicing uh, to, to send the invoice out. So now in those sort of, you know, and so if I had to add uh, one more to that core tech stack, right, it'd be QBO um, along with ProConnect for tax work. But uh, when you create the client in QBO, now it creates the client in ProConnect, right, which is what I use for tax returns. So in all four of those main places where I need to have client data, uh, you know, I've got it as soon as that uh, client signs their engagement in Ignition. So, you know, anything on top of that, so email marketing, you know, I want to be able to put new clients into a, into the email list. You know, it, it, I could create that using Zapier or one of these other API programs. Um, you know, and so again, if there's something that, uh, you know, doesn't necessarily integrate with that, then it's not necessarily a deal breaker. Uh, but man, I, I, I do definitely include uh, either uh, direct API or, uh, is app your integration, uh, high on the list of qualifiers that I'm looking for. And I'm thinking about adding stuff to my tech stack. Okay. Let me ask you this. Why is you, what you said was Zapier and an API. What you did not say was make. Yeah. Cause I haven't gotten into it yet. Uh, okay. uh Zapier, uh, is, is over my head. Uh, sometimes. And, uh, you know, I know you are a fan of make slash Integro, Matt. I, honestly, mm-hmm. I've, I've watched, uh, I've watched uh, Jason stats uh, do some work in make in one of his, uh, I think it was still Integro, Matt at the time, uh, yeah. really early on, but this was a couple years ago now, I believe. And uh, I just, I, I never got into it. The things that I need to do, or at least that I think I need to do, I can make them happen in Zapier. And I just haven't had the need to, to go beyond that. It's probably, there are probably things I'm missing out on though, by, by not looking into it. And that's, that's definitely something uh, that I, that I want to look into when I've got time though. Right. You know, like, 
<laughs> when, yep. whenever the the not never ending tax season ends um you know maybe get into that yeah i can't wait until that's over holy cow right <sighs> oh good grief anyway all right so what do we learn today what do we decide uh i i think on uh one hand you know uh think about not just the software that makes sense at the time that you're purchasing it, but the software, especially when it comes to the, the practice management and the client relationship that is going to last with your firm. Um, so similar to you, you, you know, you, you mentioned, uh, the, uh, uh, Zendesk seeming, uh, you know, expensive or, or like a big investment at the time that you got it. I felt exactly the same way about both ignition and carbon. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it almost took my business bank account down to zero, uh, when I, when I paid my first annual subscription for both of those. And I, if I had to do it all over again, I'd do it exactly the same way. Yeah. I would say that my takeaway would be just be a little bit more proactive sooner than you think is necessary around mm -hmm. building a data infrastructure for your firm. Definitely think about your workflows, um, but definitely build that data infrastructure because it's an investment and it will create value for itself over time. And then also make sure that you're thinking about the glue that holds all of those things together. So how do these apps talk to each other in a way that's going to help you run your firm in a way that's going to help you do analytics on your firm in a way that's going to help you track tasks and workflows and, um, you know, staff utilization, things like that. Those are all the things you need to be thinking about. And those are the things that, you know, a good tech stack that's well thought out, that's well glued together. Uh, those can really help you. Yeah. By, if, if you go with a proprietary option, like what one of the big, uh, one of the big firm software providers is going to go with, that's fine, you know, buy their suite and, and everything will plug in together. Um, but good luck getting anything in or out of that system but if you go with these uh more progressive newer offerings you're probably going to have those those api connections you're going to have the zapier or make connections and it i think that's just going to make your life a lot easier in the long run 100 percent, like, and that's not going away the, the the open apis the no code tools like zapier make that sort of stuff that is not going away so if you're not planning for that now you, i mean you're going to get passed on the technology front for sure. And then if, if you have to go and migrate to something else later, it is going to be a massive project. It's going to be expensive from a time and an intelligence perspective and probably a money perspective as well. I think that's especially true on the cast side. On the tax side, it's a little bit harder. We still don't really have good tax software that is open to API, but I don't know how much longer tax software can hold out, especially when we have, you know, good cloud-based tax software like ProConnect, for example, uh, you know, I think at some point they've got to start opening up some sort of API possibilities to where we can get outside data uh, into those software as well. Yeah, it already exists. They just need to open it. Like yeah. Carbon integrates with PTO. So that's, or right. yeah, with PTO, I mean, that's yeah. an API. Yeah. Um, PTO integrates with QBO. That's an API. I mean, they're, they're, they exist. They're there. DocuSign, same deal. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's already there. You just need, they just need to open it. And if they did, that would be the floodgates. And then that would open up a whole new world of automation that uh, honestly, the profession very desperately needs considering how complex tax season is, how compressed the workflow is and how limited the resources are to actually get that work done. But that is a soapbox that we can get on some other time. Awesome. Well, I, like I said, that, that conversation went in some directions I did not expect. I, I really expected <laughs> to just talk about how we're tracking work in our firms. Um, but I like the direction it went in. I, I like the way that it tied together a lot of different aspects of the modern accounting firm uh, together. And they're all things that need to be considered and taken into consideration when you're looking at how all of these different aspects of your tech stack fit together. Hey, it's Jeremy. Thanks for watching the CPA Advisory Show here on YouTube. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe, like, and leave us a comment. We'll probably read your comment on the air. Be sure to follow us on Twitter at CPA Advisory Show. And if you have an idea for a topic or guest you'd like to see, email us at host at CPA Advisory Show.com. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.